So this is module four on our DC to DC non-isolated converter design sessions. And we're going to be talking about some of the other components that make up the switching regulator circuit this time, primarily the passive devices. This is, this is our synchronous buck regulator that we have been using throughout this uh, description thus far. Uh, you can see the uh, input power source is represented by a battery on the left-hand side. We've got the power switch and the synchronous rectifier shown just as switches. Uh, we have the switch node defined, which is where the chopped voltage waveform appears between the switches and the output filter. And then we've shown the inductor and the capacitor in the averaging circuit that generates the DC output. And then that output is sensed, goes through the compensation network and the, and the uh, uh, scaling factors to match up with the reference circuit and is used to drive the control circuit, which generates the complementary drive signals to go around and drive the switches again. So we want to talk primarily about the inductors and capacitors. Um, so let's start with the inductor. Now the primary purpose for this inductor is twofold really, to, to store energy by, by storing it in a magnetic field that is generated by the current flowing through it, and to be a part of the averaging circuit that helps to convert the pulsed voltage waveform at the input of the filter into a DC voltage on the output. The waveforms you see there on the upper one uh, in red is that switch node voltage, which is Again, the voltage right between the power switches and the um, input to the inductor. When the power switch is on, which is the first increment there on the waveforms, uh, this switch node is at input voltage, Vn. And when the switch turns off, uh, that goes down very close to ground, actually slightly below ground, when the switch is off and the uh, rectifier is turned on. So you can see there's a fairly wide pulse and then a fairly narrow off time and that is recurring at a constant frequency. Now the next waveform, the next two waveforms show what's going on with the inductor. Uh, in the purple waveform, we see the switch current as defined by the inductor. And you can see that ramping up because we've got the input voltage on one side of the inductor and the output voltage on the other side. So there is a V in minus V out voltage across the inductor and that causes the current to increase. So you see the purple waveform ramping up and the actual inductor current shown in green at the bottom is also ramping up. When the switching action takes place to terminate the pulse, the switch current goes to zero and that current is immediately transferred over to the rectifier, the synchronous rectifier. And so you see it picking up, and now the voltage across the output inductor is just the output voltage because the switch node is at zero while the, um, the other side of the inductor is at the regulated output. That causes the rectifier current to get it reduced in value because the inductor current is going down, and you see that's the downslope in, uh, in the green waveform. And very simply, the value of the inductor and the peak-to-peak -peak, um, uh, difference, peak-to-peak -peak value of the current in the inductor are directly related to each other. Uh, the first equation down at the bottom defines the inductor as just the, uh, the, inver the voltage times the, uh, the amount of time that that voltage is applied. And you can see that's defined by the... Uh, um, the downslope is defined by the output voltage because that's the voltage across the inductor and one minus the duty cycle because that's the period of time that the, um, that the uh, synchronous rectifier is working. And then we divide that by the switching frequency and the peak-to-peak -peak waveform of that inductor. So we could pick the inductor value to define how much peak-to-peak -peak current we were going to have in this, in this circuit. But more commonly, we'll do it the other way around. We'll know what kind of peak-to-peak -peak current we want or we are uh, 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 des designed to, to, um, to accommodate, and that will be used to determine what the inductor value will be.
Once having determined the peak-to-peak -peak AC ripple voltage of current, I'm sorry, ripple current in the inductor, we now know what the inductor uh, has to be. And we could go to our inductor supplier and look on their catalog to find an inductor that has the right current handling capability and the inductance that we want and, and just buy that. If we feel so inclined, we could wind our own inductor by going to the core manufacturer and picking a core which is defined by a parameter that the core manufacturers have established, uh, which they identify as A sub L. And A sub L has all the magnetic characteristics of a particular core, and every individual core design has a different A sub L value. And that term works out that all you have to do is divide that into the inductance you want, take the square root, and that'll tell you the number of turns to wind on to get that particular inductor value. So the question then is, well, how much ripple current do we want or can we accommodate? And that's uh, not an easy question to answer because there really is no right answer because it's a whole series of trade-offs. But so we've shown those trade-offs in these two columns. If we were going to go for a lower value of the peak-to-peak -peak current, getting that would require a higher inductor value in the inductance that lower peak-to-peak -peak current would give us lower AC losses in the switching waveforms throughout the circuit. It would allow us to maintain continuous conductions with a lower minimum, current, minimum load current, and the output ripple would be less on the output circuit because we're not generating so much ripple current in the inductor. But the fact that it's a higher inductance value is probably going to be a bigger inductor and probably more costly. If we go the other way and say we can take a higher peak-to-peak -peak current, we can do that with a lower inductive value, which means we could, it takes fewer winding turns to get the lower inductance, and that actually also raises the DC saturation limit of our inductor and allows us faster changing of current, a faster transient response to sudden load changes um, with less inductance in series with the, with the power stage. And a lower inductor value would probably be a smaller inductor and probably cost less. So to answer the question of how much, uh, the rule of thumb is somewhere between 10% to 30% of the maximum load current to be, uh, to be delivered to the, to the load. So once you know what the load current should be or has to be, um, some number between 10 and 30% is a reasonable starting point. Once you pick that starting point, then you can look at the advantages of going upwards or downwards on the value. Some of the implications of the, your choice for uh, the peak-to-peak -peak current are, first of all, um, well, the, the top equation is just how you define it. That says once you've picked the uh, inductor value, that will give you the peak AC current that you're going to have peak to peak. Uh, we talked about maintaining continuous conduction. That means that the load can, has to be more than one half of whatever the peak to peak current is. So the smaller the peak to peak current, the closer to no load you could go and still maintain continuous conduction. Uh, that ramp of current generates a ramp of voltage because of the equivalent series resistance in the output capacitor. So there's another term that might be a factor in determining the maximum peak-to-peak uh, -peak or AC current that you can have in the inductor. And then finally, winding losses. If we had no winding losses, the RMS current, which is the current that actually contributes heating to the, and power loss to the inductor, would be just the DC current going through it. But with the addition of an AC waveform as a part of that current, um, you see there's an added term there that has the peak-to-peak uh, -peak current in the waveform, in, in the equation, which gives us a higher um, potential for losses in the inductor. So those are the trade-offs. <coughs> Moving on to the capacitors, we've got a couple of capacitors that need to be defined. The input capacitor over on the far left of our circuit is important because you recognize that the um, power switch is going to chop the input waveform or input current so that when the switch is open there's no current flowing and then when the switch is closed we've got the load current flowing on 
through the switch and the inductor and onto the output. So uh, that could generate a fairly significant amount of noise onto the power lines that are driving this circuit. So typically, we have to have some input capacitor that tends to integrate that out and provide, instead of a, chopping, a chopped voltage waveform at that point, we would have just a, uh, a ripple voltage caused by current going into and out of that capacitor, depending upon whether the, the power switch is conducting or not. So um, the, uh, the calculation for that is shown with the equation uh, up in the upper right-hand corner. And it's a function just of the load current and the duty cycle under maximum, um, uh, maximum uh, uh, voltage times when, when you you'd, uh, make that measurement. And you can pick the capacitor largely on the basis of equivalent series resistance because that, that particular capacitor sees a large amount of AC current because when the switch is closed, all the load current that was flowing has to flow down through that capacitor, and then that current has to reverse when the, uh, when the switch um, conducts again. So high AC current in the capacitor um, means that we want low equivalent series resistor. We also have to have a capacitor that has a high RMS ripple current rating. So that oftentimes says that ceramic capacitor may well be the best uh, choice. There's only one issue with ceramic capacitors that's worth keeping in mind that some ceramic uh, materials have a high D rating factor when they have a high voltage DC bias on them. So you want to look at those specs very carefully and make sure since this is seeing the input voltage, which is probably going to be a higher voltage, you want to make sure you don't pick a capacitor where the capacitor value would degrade with time because of that DC voltage. But there are those that, that, that don't have that characteristic and it's just a matter of picking the right ones. Looking at the output capacitor, we have several issues that might be uh, impacted here. The output capacitor is a factor in the overall loop stability uh, because it's one of the elements that helps us, uh, that we have to take in mind when we, when we divide the compensation circuit. Uh, it's going to determine the output ripple voltage and it also is going to be uh, a factor if we, did, if we demand sudden load changes, we have to be able to take instantaneous energy out of that capacitor to be able to accommodate that. So the overall voltage ripple is usually a determining factor, and that has two components that, that, that contribute to it. One is that just the voltage drop across the equivalent series resistance that's caused by the peak-to-peak -peak current from the inductor. That inductor current is the AC portion of it is going to go down through the capacitor and that generates a voltage across the equivalent series resistor. So ESR is one consideration there. And the other is just enough capacitor value because um, the, uh, the values of the capacity will determine that how much filtering we action we get um, to, as we convert that uh, pulsating current to DC. So if there are no unusual load transients, if the load is relatively constant, we can just pick the capacitor value and the capacitor type on the basis of the overall output voltage ripple that we're willing to accept on our output line. And that's made up of two factors. One is related to the equivalent series resistance of the, um, that's inherent in the capacitor, and the other is the capacitor value itself. And each of those can easily be handled separately. The ripple contribution caused by the ESR is just the inductor ripple current times the ESR value. So you multiply those two together and that'll give you the voltage caused by the equivalent series resistance. And the next equation down, which, is, um, which will give you then the, um, the peak to peak ripple voltage that's caused by the ripple current and the capacity value. So in other words, it's how fast the charge can go in and out of the capacitor of that AC current that's going into the into the into and out of the capacitor. So that equation will give you 
the amount of ripple voltage contributed by the capacitor value. And you add the two together, and that should be able to um, determine what, what kinds of a capacitor you need, defining both the ESR and the capacity. Typically, you want a large amount of capacitance, and you might use an electrolytic for the output capacitor, but the electrolytic capacitors tend to have a fairly high equivalent series resistance. So the, net, the, the best solution usually then is to combine some of both. You'll have an output electrolytic that handles the capacity problem while you have a, a ceramic capacitor which doesn't have so much capacity but will handle the low equivalent series resistance for a path for the AC current. Now, that's if you don't have the added factor of sudden load transients. If that's a problem, you have an additional thing you have to worry about. And with load transients, now you have to worry about an overall deviation of output voltage, which we defined in the, in the top line there as being a delta V out, which is caused by a sudden step change in load current. And that, again, we've got a couple of factors working here. Um, we've got the... Uh, again, the equivalent series resistance gets into that, but we also have to look at the change in output voltage from the load step. And it's that second equation uh, where we're going to determine the load, um, I'm sorry, it's the, yeah, the second equation um, de determines the capacity value that we're going to need based upon the ESR of that capacitor. The equation down on the bottom is a way of calculating how much charge we need, charge capacity we need to be able to handle a step change in current, um, which we have to accommodate. The way you do that, by the way, uh, when you have a step change response and we want to look and see what the response time is within our loop, we've got to go from the time domain into the frequency domain because it's the bandwidth is, is frequency dependent. And that last equation is a conversion factor that allows you to look at the time constant that, you, that um, we're going to have and relate that to an overall bandwidth consideration. And from that, we can come up with the overall capacitor value. And we can pick the capacitor then that gives us the best response to, to that problem. So that takes care of the inductors and the capacitors. And uh, the the next module that we're going to talk about are the practical implications of actually building this hardware. In other words, how we lay out the printed circuit boards.